Statistics have shown that as much as 50% of first-time IELTS takers do not achieve their desired band score. However, I believe that you can achieve your own desired band score if you know exactly what the examiners are looking for and you prepare in that light. I had a 9 in the reading section of the exam, a 9 in speaking, an 8.5 in listening, and a 7 in writing section. And that gave me an overall band score of 8.5 with the highest average possible for the exams, which is CFL2 score, which is the highest that one can get for that particular grading system. So journey with me along as I show you how I prepared for the exam and everything that you need to know. So for the reading section of the exam, this section of the exam will typically last 60 minutes in total with 40 questions and there will be three passages for you to look through. Now the questions can come either as multiple choice questions where you'd have to choose from single best options or it will be filling the gaps or it might be complete the sentence or it will come as yes, no or not given responses. Otherwise, it can also come as true, false or not given. Now, it's very important for me to help you differentiate between the option that comes as false and not given. So false talks about the fact that we know from the text that this statement is not true. Not given says the text doesn't contain the information necessary to decide. So I'll give you practical examples. The statement is this. Anita is a very tall girl. She is largely admired by everyone in the school. I'll go again. Anita is a very tall girl. She is largely admired by everyone in the school. The question now, Anita is slim, not given or false? The answer to this question is not given. The, question, the statement says Anita is a very tall girl. There was no mention about whether the fact that she's fat or she's slim. It will be easy for one to jump to the conclusion that, okay, perhaps because she's tall, there's a likelihood that she'll be slim. However, that information was not given. Anita is short is false because the statement clearly said that Anita is a very tall girl. Anita is tall is also true. It's true in that regard. So, but the not the one that comes up as not given here is Anita is slim because it was not stated in the paragraph which this was extracted from. Now, general principles to guide you as you prepare for the reading section of the exam would be learn to skim through the text. You don't have to spend your time reading through the text in detail, whichever comprehension passage you're giving. Now, after you skim through the text, you skim through the paragraphs, go to the question, read the question, and refer back to the passage to start looking out for the answers. This is the most effective way to approach the reading section of the exam. You should be aware that synonyms will be used. So you might read a question and the words that are used to phrase the question would be synonyms of words in the passage. So you don't get it confused and say that the answers are not present in the passage. So once you see similar words, they are meaning the same thing and the answer should follow the correct thinking pattern that you would have gone for as though the words were the same. You can use elimination methods and guess where or when necessary as there are no negative markings whatsoever. So you should not leave an option blank if you're not sure. Just put whatever answer comes to your mind at the forefront. You should be aware that there are maximum number of words allowed for answers. So if you read the instructions, you'll typically see that not more than two words, not more than three words. Even if your answer is correct in a sense and you entered into four words in that gap or in that sentence, you're going to lose the mark. So it's good that you adhere to the instructions. Set a time limit to tackle each section. There will be three comprehension passages. You have about 60 minutes. So it will be nice for you to go with the mindset that, okay, I will not spend more than 20 minutes on each of these comprehension passages. Again, never leave a gap blank. When gap filling, you should think of three things. Think of meaning, think of grammatical accuracy, and think of spelling. I'll go again. When you're filling in the gaps, think of meaning, grammatical accuracy, and spelling. So you look at the word. Does it rhyme with the sentence attached to it? Does the grammar match? And is your spelling correct? 
Once you get a spelling wrong, even if the answer was meant to be correct, you're going to lose the marks for that particular section of the exam. Please feel very free to skip difficult questions and return to them later. For the listening section of the exam, this session lasts 30 minutes and you have 40 questions to answer. Again, it's important that you read the instructions for each phase in this section of the exam and be aware that the question and the audio you're listening to, because what happens in this section of the exam is typically they are playing an audio recording for you and then you have to fill in up to number 40. So it will just go in that sequence. Don't um, be worried or anxious that they will give the answer to number 10 when the recording is just starting. It flows in a particular sequence. So the audio recording, the answers are in that order from number one to number 40 and just go in that light. Now, th this part of the exam is majorly a test of concentration. If you lack the ability to concentrate, it's unlikely that you'll be able to do well in this part of the exam. So one of the things that you're watching for as you're practicing for the listening section is concentration power. Another thing you should be aware of is distractors. Now, the fact that a statement comes first doesn't make it the correct answer. It may match with the sentence that you want to answer, but wait a while. I'll give you an example. So they say that this individual was living in this house in 1950. Meanwhile, the actual fill in the gap sentence that you want to enter into is for 1952. So after they mention the person who stayed there in 1950, they will go ahead to mention the person who currently stays there in 1952. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you to understand. But if you're jumping ahead of the gun, you enter the name for 1950 and your mind may no longer pick the one that was set for 1952. So be aware, beware of distractors that would come in that light. Confirm the maximum number of words allowed. Once again, if you imputing more than the required number of words, you're going to lose the marks for that particular question in the listening section of the exam. Please write what you hear, exactly what you hear. You're not allowed to rephrase. The same way you heard the words, that's how you're allowed to put it down. If you hear light, light is light. Light is not sun. Do not use synonyms. The same way you hear the word or a group of words, just enter it in the exact same fashion. The use of currency signs and decimal points are allowed. So if, for instance, you write $1,000 in words and you just put $1,000 with a symptom, both of them are allowed. The computer marking system or the paper, whoever is marking it, if you wrote the paper form of the exam, would give you the mark correctly. Ensure your spellings are correct. It's very important. If you get the word right, but your spellings are wrong, you're going to lose the mark for that particular question. There's no negative marking. So when you are in doubt, you're allowed to predict the answer. You can't play the audio backwards. So sometimes you just try to think, okay, what did I hear? What did I perceive? And then you put in the answer. Use your breaks quickly to scan through. So after each page, when you're taking the listening exam, there will be like a minute break for you to make corrections or fill in some answers. You can quickly use this time to scan through the work that you answered for that particular section before moving to the next phase of the listening exam. For the speaking exam, the speaking exam has three sections and it has a total of about 11 to 14 minutes a portion to it. So there's a part one, there's a part two, and there's a part three. The part one typically lasts about four to five minutes, and it's usually something that is personal. So they will either ask you about your home, your country, your work, your school, or any other thing, but usually something personal. So practically speaking now, the question I was asked was, are you a student or you're working? Now, what one would assume would be that the correct answer to this is, I am working because I wasn't a student when I took the exam. So let me give you how I answered the exam that helped me get the band nine in that section of the exam. So my response was, I am working. I'm currently a house officer working with this teaching hospital and my job entails waking up early in the morning by five or 6 a.m., 
doing three rounds, going for morning meetings, joining the rest of the team for the ward rounds. And at the end of the day, I will carry out all the instructions that have been handed down to me, including prescribing medications, doing investigations, carrying out procedures. And if I encounter challenges at any point in all of these, I'm going to report back to my senior. The day doesn't end when I'm done with my work sometimes. Some days I'm on call, and this means that call resumes by four. If I have the opportunity, I'll quickly go to rest and resume call duties by four. Calls can be intense. Some calls can be relatively calm. But depending on how the day goes, we have to be prepared at all times. Now, I kept going like this until the man said, it's okay, I think you've spoken well enough. So the idea most times to try to communicate is the fact that do not say something so little that they will now say you should say more. It's better for you to overdrive. So I call it a two-step process. So you give the answer to the question directly, then you drive it forward. If you're wondering on what is universal that you can use to drive things, you can always keep the questions of what, where, how, when in your mind to help you. So if, for instance, talking about, you know, work, for when I could state when, when I started house job or medical internship, what the job entails, where I'm doing the house job, how I carry out my job. So all of this will just help you to keep talking. There are some things they are looking out for in the speaking phase of the exam. Your fluency, your choice of vocabulary, your grammatical range and accuracy. So you have to cut all the mm, um, all those pauses and all that can come into the flow of your vocabulary. You eliminate them as much as possible. But largely, always follow this two-step process. You give an answer and then you drive forward in that light. In the part two of the speaking section of the exam, this usually lasts about three to four minutes. And it's usually a random topic to talk about, something that maybe has happened in your past or your personal life. And you're usually given a note, a paper, and they will give you the stems to answer. And again, it would usually follow when, how, where, what, all of this happened. So you have a, about a minute to quickly jot down something that will guide your thought process. Now, you have to be careful in this part two of the exam because you want to make eye contact with the examiner. You don't want your eyes to be solely fixed on the jottings that you've made. You want to make eye contact with the examiners as much as possible. So the question they asked me practically now was, have you ever had a device that broke down? Luckily, yes, in 2018, my laptop broke down. So again, one will be tempted to just say, yes, I once had a laptop that broke down. But that's not the way to go. They've given you stems of answers. So you have what, where, when, how. I was in Port Harcourt back then when the laptop broke down. So that came into play. So maybe I should just give you a narrative of what that answer can, can look like. So yes, I once had a device that broke down. It was a laptop, a HP laptop. The color was purple. This was in Port Harcourt. I had just finished using it to study for ninth class. I closed it and I was going back to my lodge where I reside. On getting to the lodge, I opened the laptop. It comes on, but I noticed that the screen is blank and I had to take it to someone to repair. And eventually I was told that the motherboard is faulty. And then repairing the motherboard entailed me spending as much as 40% of the actual value of the system itself. We tried to repair. They repaired it. It worked for about two months again before it finally packed up. And then I had to sell it to purchase a new one. It wasn't really a pleasant experience because I was in the midst of a very tedious posting and I needed it for my assignment, for projects, for classwork, and everything pertaining to my academics within that period of time. So you see how you have to keep going with all of those subsections in mind. And as much as possible, again, make eye contact with the examiner. For the part three of the exam, this one lasts about four to five minutes. It's usually about people or just something about the society. So I was asked if I have any idea of what environmental pollution is. And I was like, yes, environmental pollution involves activities that would degrade the value of the environment. And it could be things ranging from air pollution to water pollution to land pollution, keeping in mind those terms in my mind. So I've answered the where it can happen on land, in the air or on water. So you might now ans have to answer what. So for air pollution, things like you know, exhaust fumes, where they do bush burnings, agro burning, and all of that. For the water, you might talk about oil spillage, 
where now would be the locations where these are likely to thrive high industrial areas in the different states within the country where you reside are the locations where such things are likely to happen so again you would always follow this stem you don't have to be looking at your clock or trying to time yourself the examiners are usually gracious enough if they feel like you've not exhausted your time they will tell you you have more time you can say more always follow the two-step process you give the answer the direct response and then you drive you try and cover all of the what where when how and why five stems the how sometimes can mean how to do something it can connote the meaning of something so you want your answers to be relevant you want your answers to be accurate and you want your answers to be well structured with that, you should be able to achieve a very high band in the speaking section of the exam. So the marking scheme for the speaking section usually involves fluency, appropriate choice of vocabulary, appropriate grammar, and using connecting words as you speak as much as possible. You know how you write. We'll talk about the writing section of the exam. And you're using however, moreover, firstly. All of this can still come into the speaking section of the exams to give that coherence and cohesion to what you're saying and also keep in mind that the punctuations that you would have written down if you were actually writing for the writing section of the exam you should also mirror them as you speak when it's a full stop you have a longer pause when it's a comma you have a pause that is just very little so as, but as you practice all of these things will come into the actual exam when you go for it on your exam day speaking now general conduct Establish a rapport. If you're going and it's not something that is done online, of course, if the person extends a hand for you to shake, you go ahead and give a handshake. Otherwise, just greet and say, it's a pleasure to meet you, Salma. Take a seat and lean forward. You see the way I'm sitting now? This is the right posture to sit, not something like this. Lean forward, it communicates interest. It communicates the fact that you're open to have that conversation. Do not use slangs, local or foreign. Again, do not use slangs, local or foreign. I'm sure you might be watching this video from wherever in the world. Whatever comments, there's a temptation to just assume at some point, maybe this is a casual conversation, but ensure that while you're practicing, you're not entertaining slangs, whether local slangs or foreign slangs. Stay calm and professional. Always give an extra thought after the main answer. It's great to open your sentences with, I am going to talk about... I am going to talk about, I am going to talk about, all of this would help you add the extra few seconds that you might need to meet up the requisite time for that part of the speaking exam. You can choose to look at your notes intermittently for the part two of the exam, but largely speaking, let your gaze be on the examiner. Do not pad your answers. You know this thing of trying to give examples. So I once visited France, other countries I visited include Spain, United States, United Kingdom, Brazil, Argentina, Botswana. You would be assumed to be padding your answers, you know, so be, meaning you're just trying to buy time. It's obvious that you're trying to buy time or you're trying to catch up on the thought process that you have. So as much as possible, do not pad your answers. And then please say thank you at the end of your test. It's very important. I've said it earlier, to get long answers in part 3 of the speaking test, ask why. If possible, give alternatives, opposite, and give examples. So remember, when, where, why, how, who, and what. These are things that would always guide you for you to speak in detail anytime you're asked a question about something. Now for the writing section of the exam. This seems to be the most difficult part for most persons because it requires you to be very creative, that's one. And also sometimes, frankly speaking, it can be subjective depending on the examiner who is marking your script. But generally, I have a mnemonic that would help you always assess your work based on the combination of the criteria that they need for you to excel. So I call it accept cpap lng accept cpap lng the a is for analysis break down your question into parts and answer one of the 
marking criteria is the task response so people can just start answering the question but actually do not deal with all the components of the exam if for instance it's an advantage or a disadvantage type essay someone may forget completely about the disadvantages and write solely about advantages in that case the person would lose almost half of the marks for the tax two of the writing exam so make sure you do an analysis and you address every part of the question coherence and cohesion clarity and fluency using linkage devices between paragraphs and within sentences very important the e is for examples and evidence every statement you're writing every topic sentence you're putting down i'll shed more light on this make sure you give examples and you give evidences the p is for punctuation you have to get your punctuation game correctly if you want to score a very high band in the writing section of the exam the t is for timing make sure the time doesn't catch up with you the task one approximately has about 20 minutes the task two in the writing section of the exam usually would assume about 40 minutes and it carries times two of the marks of task one so priority is given to the task two of the exam when you're writing the c for the cpap is correctness your spellings must be correct subject verb, subject verb agreement must be intact and your tenses as well must be correct past tenses should go together present continuous should go together all of those grammatical components of english they have to be intact if you want to score very high the a is for academic english you know how sometimes you're talking you're talking or you're writing in a way that is correct it's not wrong but there are more sophisticated words that you can use that's the meaning of academic english so instead of me to say i'm going to town i might say i'm heading to town you just use words that are more that would require more intellect for someone to interpret basically and then your range of vocabulary slash grammar, which, you know, I would just call maybe paraphrasing, should be intact. Your lexical resource, this is for the LNG now, vocabulary related to the topic should be intact. If I'm writing a, an essay related to the hospital, I'll be using words like doctors, nurses, lab scientists, call duties, shifts, and all of that. So the vocabulary must fit into the setting that you've been asked to write about. The number of words has to be in order as well for the writing section the task one minimum 150 words is expected of you it can be more but nothing less than that for task two in the writing section minimum of 250 words is expected of you so you have to keep that in mind and then of course your grammar must be correct so for the task one the task one typically would be chart graphs or you describing the events that happen in a map now, this could be static or could be moving. So static meaning it's just at a particular point in time. A movement graph or a movement chart or a map could be things that have changed over a period of time. This is what you want to identify because, again, the grammar you would use for these different scenarios will be different. That's one. And then also, you have to introduce every graph or chart you're giving you have to give an introduction and usually we do this introduction by paraphrasing the question so if you are giving a graph of the number of guns purchased in a particular community between let's say 1990 and 2000 you have to paraphrase the question the question says you should describe this chart that shows the number of guns that were purchased in a community between 1990 and 2000 so you might go and you give the introduction as this graph illustrates, in case the question said shows, this graph illustrates the amount instead of the number of guns that people bought within the time period of 1990 to 2000. I'm just trying to give you an example, but you have to use alternative words for you to get that part of the whole write-up. Give an overview or make a test statement. So an overview is generally what is happening. If you look at that chart, if you look at that graph, was there an increase in the number of guns purchased from 1990 to 2000? Or was there a decrease? That's like an overview. It's also part of your introduction. And then you go, you have a topic sentence and you describe. 
either for paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, and then you give a conclusion. In your conclusion, please, it's very important. There should be no exact figures. You should be able to restate the general trend and summarize your findings. Remember, the number of words should be at least 150. Most examiners have said they do not mind words up to 225, but they don't want to read anything more than that. And make sure as much as possible, every detail is captured, but you do not have to write all the words. So let me describe what a topic sentence means for you. So the topic sentence essentially introduces that paragraph. So if I'm going to be talking about the changes that happen within the years, the topic sentence would go in that light. These are the changes that happen within the year 1990 to the year 2000, for instance. If I'm coming from the angle of the amount of guns, I would be stated this way. This paragraph will illustrate the number of guns that were bought within the year 1990 to 2000. I'm trying to give practical examples for you to understand. Now, after that topic sentence, I will now go into detail talking about what happened within those years. Moving ahead, I have a mnemonic that would always guide you when you're answering the task one of the writing exam. And this is S-E-C-C-T-G. The S Remember, static or movement, and your grammar has to go in that light. The E is for exceptions. Now, there will be the general trend we talked about, but there will be some exceptions. So, assuming that, you know, the general trend was the number of guns people purchased within that community was increasing. However, in the year 1995, there was a decrease. Now, that's an exception, and it must be mentioned specifically when you're answering the writing for that task one essay. Comparison is important. So when you're looking at the years, you should be able to make reference to the year 1994 saw a decrease to one third of the year of 1990. Instead of you putting the exact number, you have to make these inferences by yourself from the essay. And that's how you compare. The year 2000 saw a double, in a double fold increase in the number of guns purchased as compared to the year 1990. So this is how you would be working when you're writing. So ensure you make comparisons. If there are any contrast, any stark contrast, it's important that you state them as well. Do not forget, you have to state the overall trend and then learn to group events or group things together. It's also very important. You can group from the largest to the smallest or you can group from the smallest to the largest, whichever way you decide to go if it applies in that particular situation. For the task two of the writing exam, it carries times two of the max. There are different types of task two essays. It could be opinion, style essays, where you have to agree or disagree. It could be advantages or disadvantages type. It could be problem and solution type. It could be discussion type, where you have to discuss both views that you've been given. Or it could be a two-part question type. So for the opinion, Agree or disagree type essay, practical example, a question. Some people believe that unpaid community service should be compulsory in high school programs. For example, working for a charity, improving the neighborhood, or teaching sports to younger children. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Now, you have to answer both of them. You give reasons why you agree, and you also give reasons why you disagree. However, if you know you would want to pitch your tent towards agreement you can give three points why you agree and give just one why you disagree they are not trying to judge your intelligence they are just trying to judge how well you can convince them of your reasoning process that's one thing that the essay section of the IELTS exam is aimed at the next type is the advantages and disadvantages type essay so technology is being used more and more in education discuss the advantages and the disadvantages. We would always recommend an average of three ideas to support whatever points you're pitching forward. So if you're saying these are the advantages, you should be able to have at least three advantages and you give evidences or you give examples or instances why those are advantages and you do the same thing for disadvantages. At the end of the day, all of this should not exceed 250 250 words is the minimum 
but examiners would say it should not exceed about 325 words. That's the most number of words they'll be interested in marking. It could be problem and solution type essays. So students are becoming more and more reliant on technology. What are some of the problems associated with reliance on computers? And what are some of the possible solutions? The same principles. You give an introduction, you give your general thoughts, and then you come into the paragraphs. Let's say paragraph one would address the problems. Paragraph two would address the solutions. In the problems, you have a topic sentence, and then you go, you list the problems, you give examples, adhering to all the principles of writing where we talked about cohesion, cohesiveness between paragraphs, between sentences. So you have things like firstly, you have things like secondly, you have things like however, you have things like moreover. All of these have to come into your writing to make it uniform, to make it unique and sound well in the ears of the person reading it. You could also have discussion type essays where you discuss both views. Now, take for instance this question. Technology is being used more and more in education. Some people say that it's a positive trend, while others argue that it's leading to negative consequences. Discuss both sides of this argument and then give your own opinion. So now you have to give ideas for both sides and then you are going to state which one you lean towards the more. It's a straightforward style in the writing. Or you could have a two-part question type. Example, as most people spend the major part of their adult life at work, job satisfaction is an important element of individual well-being. What factors contribute to job satisfaction? How realistic is the expectation of job satisfaction for all workers? You have two individual things to address in this question. Remember, we said accept CPAP LNG, and that A stands for analysis. You should be able to address all the questions for you to get the highest band in the task response for the marking scheme. The summary of how you should approach the task to give an introduction that encapsulates the general idea, paraphrase the question, and give a general thesis statement. I have like two to three paragraphs, each paragraph having a topic sentence and having supporting sentences, which would have about three ideas with examples, results, or evidence, or the reason behind those responses. In some instances, you can give a consensus. So you've been asked to give your opinions about two things, and then you go towards the end and you say, Yes, you've stated your views, but however, you will lean more towards this because of this, 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 and that. That's an example of a concession. In your conclusion, restate or summarize what you have written and leave something remarkable that is like a food for thought. So some people end their essays with maybe a quote. They end it with a rhetorical question, whatever the case is, but you want to leave the person marking that essay with a feeling of, yeah, this is a good write-up in your conclusion. Remember, the number of words should be at least 250 and a maximum of 325 words. Task response marking scheme for the writing section of the exam. Task response talks about your ability to answer a question, support and develop ideas, and present a clear position. You have to do this to score well in the writing section of the exam. Coherence and cohesion. You have to logically arrange this essay and the ideas with it and use appropriate cohesive devices in between your sentences and in between paragraphs. So usually the paragraphs would have in between them things like however, furthermore, moreover, as I stated earlier. But within your sentences, you might have things like on one hand, on the other hand, firstly, secondly, thirdly, and all of that. It just gives this sense of completion and makes it smooth for whoever is reading to understand as well. Lexical resource, use a range of, of vocabulary and make sure that you're using it appropriately. So do not keep repeating words. If you've used the word here, for instance, you've used the word advantage, you can use merits, you can use benefits, you can use positives. All of these are saying the same thing, but you're telling the examiner that you have a number of words within your vocabulary. You have to use a good grammatical range and also make sure that your grammar is accurate. So this talks about 
concord, subject, verb, agreement, and all of that. So these are things that you should be watching out for when you're answering the writing section of the exam. General rules again, do stay on course, do not deviate. Do not waste time trying to memorize essays or model answers to use in tests. Just have a pattern and follow the pattern when you're writing. Your essay must have a natural, smooth flow for the reader to follow. The use of cohesive devices, conjunctives and connectives should be used to link sentences and paragraphs. This is coming over and over again. For examples, in conclusion, moreover, however, in contrast, by comparison, nevertheless, meanwhile, for instance, refer this, it, this, which. You have to put all of this into context when you're writing. You use academic English. It's very important. Your vocabulary should be right and it should be wide. Confirm correctness at the end. Mistakes in spelling should be corrected. Subject verb agreement should be in tandem as well. Now, just a quick thought. The computer IELTS, IELTS exams and the paper based, which is better? In my opinion, I think the computer is better. You're as fast as you would be with the paper IELTS with a little practice. Marking and other technical issues are addressed faster. It takes about three to five days for you to see your results with the CBT and as long as two weeks sometimes for you to get your results with the paper-based test. If there are any issues you want a remark and all of that, it will take even longer time for the paper-based test. So in my opinion, go for the computer-based test. You just have to practice a bit more so that the phobia for maybe your speed of writing, during the writing section of the exam and all of that is addressed. And also the computer-based test completely eliminates the possibility of submitting a rough work. If you're writing on paper, you may have translations, but if you're writing on computer, you're typing on computer rather, you just erase, patch it up, do whatever you want to, and your work still comes out intact. You eliminate the bias that someone may have from seeing a work that is rough with translations and all of that. So if you were to ask me, I would recommend that the computer-based exam is the one you should go for. So I have to share with you, it's not like this is my first exam and it was pitch perfect. It's my first, but I had some issues. Initially, the writing section of my exam was, I think, scored 6 or 6.5. So I had to apply for a remark because, yes, I realized I made one or two mistakes you know, that fell out of the task response column, which I've just taught you. But I also knew that I was going to be expecting either a band 7.5 or a 7 from my own assessment. So I took the risk, you know, of course I was praying and then I applied for the remarking that morning. Within 30 minutes to one hour, they sent back the results and it had changed. So for those of you who would write the exam and you feel strongly about certain sections of the exam that there was a mistake, this is an encouragement that you can take the risk. You know you have to pay for remarking, but they refunded my money eventually. So if you're very convinced that there was a mistake somewhere, you can apply for remarking with the hopes that your complaints will be addressed. So here's to wishing you success in your IELTS exams. I hope you achieve your desired band score. Till next time, I remain Gospel Ikutukin, and thank you for watching till this point. I'll see you again.